And nothing beats a trail to travel farther every day I'd rather have lake and trees and rock than a hideaway in a southern box Hi, Dave Hadfield here, and I've been hauling things into the bush by hand to go camping since the middle 1980s. And if there's one thing I've learned is that human beings make lousy sled dogs. We haven't got enough legs. We only have two. Left the train three hours ago, superb traveling, except for one minor incident. <laughs> and uh, just ahead of us, I hope to find the uh, holes that we stashed in a tree for the wall tent uh, in 2017, right up here in that open area. Of course, a very good question is why use sleds at all? Why not just carry everything on your back? Well, in mountaineering situations, sleds may not be practical. But in the Canadian shield forest where I go, sleds are easier, they're more practical, and they take less energy to move a quantity of gear from one place to another. We're not usually climbing mountains here. Although sometimes it feels like that. We're on a height of land portage. And I've divided my two pelican load into one so I can get up the hill. But the really strong guys, like Hans, the tractor, they don't need such penny ante stuff. They just go straight uphill. Out Mr. of the way, out oh, the way. Man, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. One really nice aspect of a sled over a backpack is that anytime you stop, you're resting. Whereas if the load's still on your back, you're not. And in the deep, thick snow of the Canadian Shield Forest, unpacked and soft, you sink in a lot deeper if you've got a heavy pack on your back. Even with snowshoes on, you can end up post-holing in the snow. Most people, of course, use snow machines, and they're really smart. <laughs> but there is a downside. Every mechanical device you take with you into the bush is a liability. And what might have been an effortless ride in might end up being a long walk out. Nevertheless, one option that can work is to hire a snow machine to get you and your party the first 10 or 15k into the bush. And after that, they drop you off. I prefer the train, the bud car, but the snow machine is an option. I love traveling with dogs, and a good sled dog team is just a pleasure to be with. But that's a big commitment to make for the rest of the year. I used to travel with my neighbor's dog, Hallie, uh, Husky Samoid Cross, just one dog. And actually, that worked out quite well. She had the best aspects of both breeds and was a good companion. And there are other rigs for other situations. But if you want to be truly portable, it's pull, pull, pull. And while you're doing that, all you can think of is, how do I make a better sled? <laughs> So over the years, I have tried just about every kind of sled and toboggan you can imagine. I started off with a traditional shape, but took advantage of a modern low-friction material, high-density polyethylene. This worked, but I came up with easier pulling designs later. The basic toboggan is lightweight, but if you're in snow, and it is snowing, the thing can pick up 20 extra pounds as snow wedges itself into every corner and crevice of your load. Even if you use a cover, snow still gets packed in hard along the sides. The general idea of a toboggan like this is that you need the flotation in soft snow. But that's not completely correct because you're always ahead of it and you're always wearing either snowshoes or skis, so there's always at least a partially packed trail ahead of you. And if there isn't, one trick you can use is to hitch two people together and then pull both loads, and that gives a double pack ahead of the first sled. I'll talk more about harnesses later. In those days, I was traveling with a friend of mine who had a dog team, so I made another sled which was like a dog sled in miniature. The two runners were made of high-density polyethylene. And it worked fine, but it was just too small to be useful for a hand-hauling bush trip. What you want in one of these sleds or toboggans is something that's long and narrow, not short and wide. Long and narrow stays in the snowshoe track and pulls easier. And though you might think that being narrow will encourage it to tip over, an actual fact, if it's long, that tendency is reduced. And also, if the sled is long, you don't have to double stack it, which you do if it's short. I thought about recreating an actual Cree wooden toboggan, 
but I wanted to reduce the friction of having the whole thing in contact with the snow. And I didn't want to have to wax it. Snow sticks to wood much more than a modern surface. So I hit upon the idea of using a set of downhill skis. After all, in ski construction, there's always been a great deal of commercial pressure to make them low friction. And skis are designed to hold up a big person in even powder snow. So I did that. I bought a set of K2s about 210 centimeters long from maybe 1983 for 10 bucks and built my first ski sled. These have worked out really well. In any kind of snowshoe pack at all, the skis have plenty of support to carry a load. Which makes sense, since the sled only weighs about 20 pounds and perhaps you put 70 pounds of camp gear on. So really, it's a light load. It's like towing a child on a set of adult skis. Pretty easy. I tested the two designs out against each other. Identical loads in identical conditions. The polyethylene toboggan versus the ski sled. With only one snowshoe pack ahead and the ski sleds pulled easier. Here's some video from the 2020 trip. Here's the uh, other sled that I've made years ago and I still use. Uh, it's a ski sled and obviously you can buy these old downhill skis for uh, peanuts, these, you know, five, ten dollars at a, at a swap shop or pawn shop these days, but they make really good uh, sled runners and you have to make it narrow and long enough to go in a snowshoe track, a snowshoe float. Now, if I was doing this again, this is uh, 3 8 plywood, I believe. Yeah, 3 8 If I was building this again, I would make it lightweight. I would use a quarter inch higher grade, you know, more expensive plywood to reduce the weight. And on these risers here, which are based on two by fours, and I've cut them out a little bit. I don't know if you can see that. I've cut them out a little bit, you know, uh, to, to an I-beam shape, but I would hollow, I would put holes in them I think I didn't do that before because I didn't want snow to catch in there. So these sleds, we've left them upside down like this so the uh, runners don't stick, you know, so it's faster start in the morning. These uh, sleds have a canvas containment, so you don't need packs. You just use cardboard boxes, reinforced cardboard boxes. It is the best storage system for these f that I've found. Way better than plastic tubs, which waste a whole lot of space and it's lighter and stronger. Uh, and then I made these hooks for a hook and loop system out of a quarter inch brake tubing that's pounded flat and then bent around into a, that kind of shape. They pull really well. I mean, that set of downhill skis is designed to support a 200 pound or more person because, you know, I got the longest skis I could get. And, um, Generally, there's only 100, or not even that, 70 pounds of load on this at the most. So there's another ski sled. I have two of them. And uh, these are the boxes that I use. They're just he sturdy cardboard boxes, painted, in this case, with an oil paint green, and uh, gone around with tape, and, and uh, no space is wasted. They're just perfect. And they don't even need lids because these sleds have containments on the top, and uh, nothing can get loose, and it saves weight because this is far lighter than a pack is. It's important to understand that the entire sled is a pack. And to save weight, you don't need individual packs for all your stuff. For bedding and clothing and that sort of thing, we just use stuff sacks or even clear plastic garbage bags, which work surprisingly well. When you hand haul a sled in poor conditions and deep snow, all you think about <laughs> is weight. <laughs> So the question arises, why do you have to make a sled at all? Can't you just buy something? And the answer is generally no. What you can buy are kids' sleds and toboggans, you know, for the local hill, or you can buy snow machine equipment. And any kind of uh, sled that you tow behind a skidoo or snow machine is too wide. It won't fit in a snowshoe track. We've tried them, and on a hard pack surface, they pull easily. But then everything pulls easily on a hard pack surface. But unless conditions are easy, like in this picture, it'll ride up on one side or the other of the pack trail and generate a lot of drag. And when your legs are the snow machine, you don't want that. Also, they tend to be heavily made so that they don't destroy themselves when they're being towed at speed behind a snow machine. Anyway, my next sled was a U.S. Army surplus pulk. A friend of mine from Alberta came out and joined us on a trip, and I bought it from him so he didn't have to take it back. <laughs> 
It kind of looks like a ski patrol sled. It's made out of fiberglass, and while it's not lightweight, it does pull easy. The, the wonderful thing about this sled, it's made out of fiberglass, and it has these th those three runners on it. And uh, these runners cause it to rise up, you know, out of the snow if there's any kind of pack at all. It's amazing. You're walking along behind this thing, and all you see is two or the three runners, and you don't see any indication of the body of the sled at all. It's just great. It's a little heavy though, and we're going to find out tomorrow how heavy it is when we go over the height of land to the next lake. And that's what we were doing today, finding a trail. Well, we found it, but on any trail with an uphill grade, you wish your rig was lighter. And that led me to another idea, towing two pelican sleds in tandem. Two, because one simply isn't big enough to carry a load, and so that you can divide the load when you're going up or down a steep hill. They're just Toboggan Hill kids sleds, but with some modifications, they work well. And they're so light that if they're unpacked and the wind picks up, they can actually blow away. <laughs> anyway, these sleds are great. They weigh nothing, cost 20 bucks, but I've reinforced them. And uh, you can see from the underside there, I've got a, an aluminum plate, three quarter inch by one eight, uh, pierced by eye bolts for a crisscross tying system and uh, uh, this is a towing system reinforcement so that the plastic isn't going to rip out. Here's a bit of video from out in the middle of a lake. I'm going to have to narrate this because the wind noise on the lake got too strong. There is a line of hooks on the far side of that sled. Those hooks are fixed and not adjustable and they don't slip around because of the nut that's trapped in there. The hooks themselves are replacement hooks for bungee cords. The other line, closest to the viewer here, is totally adjustable so that you can have quick and easy access to the load, which is super important because if you stash your mitts or a jacket on the load and then lose them because they weren't contained properly, well, you could end up with frostbite later on. Anyway, how do we pull these things? Well, my trip partners and I have tried just about everything, and what we've settled on is this Army Surplus towing harness. There are a few really good points. The main towing effort is down at your waist, so that it doesn't affect your back at all. Nice, big, wide, soft, easy canvas belt. And there are quick release, quick in and out uh, fixtures there that are handy. Next, it has an over-the-shoulder strap, so the uh, rig can't slide down. And it has big D-rings, both on the front and the back, so that two people can pull one load. We use these in conjunction with carabiners, and it makes the rig really simple to use. You've probably noticed that we generally use ski poles when we're hauling a load. Obviously, being able to push with your hands does make you stronger and more efficient, but there are a couple of other good reasons to use poles. Sometimes it helps a lot when you're feeling for a trail. You know, sometimes on an out and back trip, you will make a trail and then they'll be snowing and blowing. And when you come back, it's soft, but if you can get onto the trail that you laid down on your way out, uh, it becomes easier to pull. And you can't see it. There's no visual indication at all. But you can feel for it with your poles. It's really handy to have poles. The other aspect of poles, which is convenient, is if you ever did go through the ice and you don't have ice picks on, you can... Um, shorten up on the pole, grab it like this with the point sticking out, right? Uh, sticking back, and then hopefully claw your way out of the claw your way out of the hole using the poles. Anyway, you haven't truly experienced the Canadian winter bush until you leave the roads behind. For me, it's a time of connection, not isolation. So I hope that this and my other videos. We'll encourage you to seek out some instruction, put together some gear, and wander your own path. The snow falls and the wind blows. There are no walls where the land froze. There's black spruce and jack pine. Hard rock and it's all mine. And nothing beats a trail to travel farther every day. I'd rather have Lake 
and trees and rock that I hide away in a southern box.